welcome to today's daily boost. This is your truly Dr. Charles and David. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we have an amazing, amazing daily boost. This is Wonders Wednesday, and I want to make sure you can get along, get your friends on board, let them know that we are ready to roll. That means if you have a list on Facebook or YouTube, you want to share this with as many people as possible. It's going to be life changing today. And I know that you're not expecting this, but some of you were expecting. I have a special guest today and we have Amy Gabriel. Welcome to Daily Boost. Hi. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, this is our baby. You know, she grew up in this house and uh, it's been amazing to see what God has been doing with you. Uh, the powerful thing God has been doing. And uh, for just um, for those that don't know you yet, <laughs> we know you very well. Oh. Just tell them a little bit about who you are and what you do and so that they get to know you better. Well, I'm Amy. I'm Amy Gabriella Jadoui. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's my last name. And I'm actually one of the youth leaders here at Kingdom Embassy. I teach the youth here on Fridays. Uh, I have like little live streams here and there and it's really nice because I'm watching all these kids grow in the Kingdom of God. But besides that, you'll always catch me in like the background with like the ushers or whoever, whatever I can get my hands on. Um, I've been with this ministry since like, uh, like since 20, 2011. So yeah, it's so like really cool. she, she was literally raised in this ministry. And uh, we want to welcome those that are watching us from, from London. We have Martha and then we have uh, Biegit. We have uh, Aurora. God bless you. We have Peju all the way from Nigeria. And uh, we have Kelly. We have Chris, Chantel, Monica, God bless you. And uh, we just let us know what country you're watching from. And we want to be able to acknowledge you so that you can actually feel welcome to this program. So, well, giving them a little bit about who you are and what you do. And uh, tell us, we had a great thing that happened a couple of uh, days ago, which was on our Saturday was it? Yes. We had the movie night. Tell us a little about about the movie night. So Saturday Club is a group that runs like after, uh, what's it called? Uh, every fourth Saturday of the month, we'll be doing like a program, whether it be going out, evangelizing. So we can take up the music. Um, <laughs> it's just so that way, you know, we can all fellowship together as a family and invite new people who are into like the kingdom of God, especially here because sometimes it's intimidating coming in and you're just like walking in and you see everything going on it's just like an amazing thing that we do this saturday however we did have a movie night that's right and we watched uh passion of the christ which oh, was that was amazing that yes. was phenomenal yes <laughs> and it was honestly it was just great just watching all the people here there was even children involved which melted my heart and yes. at the end of that we actually had an altar call which was very surprising and honestly i just it was really nice. I, I, I think that everybody was actually wrecked by, the, <laughs> I mean, everybody was weeping and crying and it was amazing, you know, to see what God was doing. Mm -hmm. And um, if we can just make sure we, we have the, the shot right. Um, so um, everybody was watching mm -hmm. and I came in the back. I couldn't move. I was weeping. <laughs> and it was just the glory of God swept through the whole place. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic. It was. And um, then you, you made the altar call and people were all over the place weeping. Mm -hmm. Hearts were healed. People were healed. All kinds of marvelous things happened. Mm -hmm. And because people don't know that they can actually use uh, a movie night to evangelize. Mm -hmm. And you guys came up with this idea all by yourself. <laughs> And um, we are so proud of you guys and Aww. what you guys are doing. And also we have the TGIF. What, what is the TGIF? Um, TGIF, it's a short form for Thank God It's Friday. It's a group that we do. We don't promote it as a youth, club, a youth group. We promote it as a youth club. Uh -huh. So that way the youth can come here on a Friday night after school. And if they, you know, like, if they have nowhere to go, come here. Here we teach you not only how to be successful, but we also give you tips and tricks on how to navigate life as a high schooler, college student, or even a middle schooler. Wow, this is amazing. And this is happening at the embassy. You don't want to miss any service here because every time we show up at the embassy, mm -hmm. something amazing is taking place. And by the way, we have the Power School of Miracles coming up. It's coming up very, very soon from the 19th to the 26th of July. And uh, you've been 
you basically, you've been working the power school, you were yeah. a baby when you came into the power school. Mm -hmm. uh, what has been your experience been like in the power school to see lives of people being transformed? Well, actually, power school showed me that miracles can happen anywhere, anytime, in any place. That's right. It brought me up. I remember the first power school I went to, and I remember that everyone was so welcoming and loving to me. And at other churches, I never really experienced that. But here, it was really nice because the first people that I remember seeing is Naisha and Lauren. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Naisha came up to me and danced with me in the front. And Lauren let me hold Isaiah. And I remember just holding him. And then ever since then, I just knew this was home. But as I said, you see healings here every day, that entire week. And it's like a new miracle. And then the lessons as well is what made me who I am today. So honestly, even if you're brand new, you should just come. Uh, <laughs> Literally. <that's... laughs> you should just come. Even if you know you're out of state, you're in state, just come because you really don't want to miss it. Oh, I tell you, you know, one of the things I realized is every power school is different. Yes. And uh, people always say, this is the best power school mm -hmm. until the next one. Yes. Yes. It seems <laughs> like that seemed to be the thing. You said, wow, I was so touched. People walk into an atmosphere of love mm -hmm. and they're totally transform they're totally transformed but uh, we're glad to have you because by the way we you know there was something you taught on friday that i thought everybody should be really in tune with the teaching you you did on friday well maybe not a lot of people watch it but they get a chance to watch it on daily boost and um one of the things i was we were talking earlier about the vision of the youth and the church I mean, what, what's the passion? What drives the young people here at the embassy? Mm -hmm. Well, the youth here, we all have this one passion, this one thing that we all strive to do, which is be successful in the kingdom of God and bring that success to not only the people around us, but to the people who are outside of here. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. So it means basically you're not trying to do church. Mm -hmm. You're trying to be the church in motion mm -hmm. to go out and help people out beyond the walls of a building. Yes. And that's what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. It's so we, we're so excited about this, and uh, I'm telling you, uh, if you're a young person, uh, if you're a youth, I'm a youth too. I'm a child of God. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we are all. Uh, Pastor Lou will tell us we we are youth, right? <laughs> yeah. So we always are part of this. You know, uh, if you're a young person, you want to connect with uh, with the team here. Uh, mm -hmm. How can they reach you? How can they? How can they reach you? Is it by Facebook or? Yeah. Yeah, so give, just give them a bit of your handle, and we're going to post that later on, too. Uh, so, yes? Yeah, so my Facebook is Amy Gabriela Jadwi. Um, you can always find me there. You can message me through Messenger, anything. I will always be there, and I'll always answer. Uh. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't worry. I'll be there 100% of the time. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. So uh, we were talking. Uh, you were actually teaching the other day, and um, we were all just amazed at the topic. A lot of people talk about um, what they go through, what people have done against them, and all the things. And then the Bible actually tells us: so when we when we have faith, when we believe, we re, you know, when we pray, we believe, we receive it, and it's done. But in at another verse, it says, "When we stand praying, forgive." I think sometimes forgiveness has been misunderstood by a lot of people. A lot of people have misunderstood forgiveness. Now, what is uh, forgiveness? What, what, what can you tell the people? Because you taught it so well, I thought, wow, very profound. What is forgiveness? So forgiveness is uh, when you wholeheartedly and un like, you understand the mistake, you accept the mistake. And even though they make that mistake one, two, or three, or how many times, you still, at the end of the day, forgive. And you don't let that mistake hold against them. Like, you don't hold that against them for, like, years on end. Because people have the tendency to say, I forgive you, but they're holding, they're holding back and saying, well, uh, I've heard people say things like, uh, <laughs> you can uh, forgive, but you don't forget. I mean, I, I mean, what do we call that? No, it thinks it's almost like they're faking it. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you call that? False forgiveness? Yes. Well, what, what, how can you define false forgiveness? So false forgiveness is when you forgive someone, but you're not 100% forgiving them. Like, for example, you are, you know, you're in dating stage uh -huh. and you are dating your, your, your girlfriend. Your mm -hmm. girlfriend actually does, and she, one day she sees you chewing with your mouth open. Mm -hmm. And she's like, can you stop doing that? And you know what? You say, okay, I'll, I'll fix that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a couple of years go by, you guys get married, have kids. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you guys start arguing. 
and it's probably about something else that does not involve eating. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, she will mention, yeah, and I hate the way that you eat. You promise me you will <laughs> forgive me. But that's the thing. So it was unrelated, but yeah. it triggered something that they thought was done with, forgiven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, they're arguing about an unrelated thing, yes. and then they bring it back up. Yes. So that meant they never really forgave you. Mm -hmm. So they just basically say, I forgive you just to keep things moving, mm -hmm. but their hearts were not really in the place mm -hmm. to a forgiven people. Yeah. So that's, wow. So basically, if there is a, a false forgiveness, how can somebody forgive somebody wholeheartedly? I mean, we call it a complete forgiveness. How does it look like? So complete forgiveness is when you actually, like as I said before, forgiveness is forgiving someone, but not holding it against them, you know? Uh -huh. So whole forgiveness is making sure that you help them out if they keep making the same mistake. At the end of the day, it's still a, like, you know, they're learning from their mistake. If they made the mistake, maybe it's because they haven't been taught the solution yet. And we are the solution. That's so right. why hold them from that mistake? Why limit them because, you know, they made that mistake? That's what wholehearted forgiveness is. And I've experienced it, and I've also experienced also false forgiveness because I'm, I'm a college student, so it happens a lot, you know? So, and, so you mean uh, people in college get into trouble too? Oh, um, no, yeah, of course, <laughs> they do. I, I, I thought college kids were immune to issues. Oh no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so you guys basically have lots of issues in college? Yeah. Okay, I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is that because I'm in college, I witness it a lot, a lot of between my friends, uh, my friend group specifically, we like to, they are very unbothered by a lot of things that happen around. Mm -hmm. So if you make a mistake, they'll be like, it's okay, it's fine, it's a mistake. Like, what can you do? Mm -hmm. But then I have one or two of those friends in the past who will hold it against me and they will mention it. Like, it happened to me this summer, actually. Really? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, when it happened to me, we were arguing at first because I, she took something that I said and she misunderstood it. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I can't believe you would do this. And I was like, you know, I didn't mean it in this way. You're just twisting it up. Mm -hmm. So two weeks go by. I feel bad because, you know, things were said. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? We're adults. We should get over this. So mm -hmm. I text her again. She doesn't text me until like another week. And then we, we rekindle our friendship. Mm -hmm. The next week, we got into another argument, and she brings back the previous argument into the same argument we're having now. Are you serious? Yeah. She actually brought back everything that you thought it was done with, mm -hmm. and so what happened uh, after she brought it back? What was what hap really happened to your relationship? Um, well, it kind of ruined the relationship in a sense, because personally, if you make a mistake, if I make a mistake, I, I want to fix that, you know, the, like, I know better and I hope they would know better too. So, mm -hmm. actually, after that, I remember I let her go, I let her distance herself because, you know, she needed some time to think. Okay. And so when I let her go, she still texts me to this day, actually. And we're good friends and she's really nice. It's just, she had that moment in time, but, you know, that happens only when a lot of things happen around you too. Because, you know, there's like a lot of things. Like, you can tell when a person really wants to get better mm -hmm. and they want to learn from their mistakes. Mm -hmm. And with her, I gave her wholehearted forgiveness because she apologized to me. Mm -hmm. And she said, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to be like that, you know? Yeah, no, sometimes I think um, we have to learn to be patient with people too. Mm -hmm. Give them some room to really turn around. Yeah. Because if we held it against them, can you imagine if God had held it against us? Mm -hmm. So we have to really learn to be patient with people. We don't sometimes realize that they go, they're dealing with some things that has really nothing to do with what we said. Yeah. But they throw all those things back at us from the past and we are kind of confused. Like, mm -hmm. I thought we, we had sort, sorted out that thing. So um, we give them room to turn around. But then you find out that maybe just maybe they needed a little space you give them some space mm -hmm. so that they can work out their issues yeah. but in your heart you want to make sure between you and god your heart is clear is that correct mm -hmm. so um what would you say how do you approach it when you're dealing with people that are difficult and you've forgiven them or they're holding things again how, how would you deal with some of those things so in my situation, I let her go. I let her have a moment in time to, you know, rekindle her heart, fix herself in a sense, so that way she could gather her thoughts. When someone is holding a grudge against you and they continuously hold that against you for like the longest of times, 
what you do is you let them go. Now, for a lot of people, they might be like, but you're the solution. You should be the solution. You should be the person to help them. Yes, you should be. But at the same time, I gave this example like a gas station. Um, we're all a part of a gas station. We're like a pump. But you're not going to see someone feed a car water because you know that's going to ruin the car. That's right. So letting them go and find their actual, like the actual person who's supposed to be the solution. You know, I've had people in the past, like recently, who've apologized to me because they've bullied me throughout all of my middle school life. So basically you've been bullied, but mm -hmm. it doesn't look like you ever went through any ruffles. <laughs> You're so perfect. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so they actually bullied you while you're in middle school. Yeah. And then you forgave them. You didn't allow that to change mm -hmm. who you were, what you were called to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, you let them go and then they met you after many years. Mm -hmm. And so what happened? They met me and they were like, Amy, I'm sorry for what I did. And I was like, what? Because I didn't expect that, you know? As a middle schooler, when I was younger, I never expected them to come up to me and be like, I'm so sorry. Because everything they did hurt me at a point. You know, that's, those are words. But at, at such a young age, I learned to forgive and mm -hmm. literally to forget. Because if you linger on those thoughts, you're limiting not only them, but you're limiting yourself. You're limiting their, their purpose and the opportunity for them to get saved. And you don't want to limit someone to get saved. Maybe the only thing they need is just, you know, a little bit of time, maybe a nice touch, like right here on their shoulder. Maybe they need some encouraging words. But if you keep holding a grudge against them, you're not going to let that door open up for them, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's like when they came up to me, I was surprised. But at the end of the day, I took their apology and I accepted it. Mm -hmm. And we talk to this day, and it's funny because people don't believe me when I say I talk to my bullies sometimes. And I'm uh -huh. like jokingly, like, they're my bullies. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, these guys, I've known them since middle school. But, you know, they <laughs> love me, and I love them. So that's all I that matters. I think sometimes the people that are, that, that are the bullies, mm -hmm. they didn't know any better. They, they were going through their own issues mm -hmm. and maybe this is what they learned from others. Mm -hmm. And so they become an, an expression of what was sown into them. Yeah. And so you give them room to turn around and people are kind of surprised mm -hmm. that you actually did something like that. Yeah. And um, you, uh, I, I heard you say the other day that uh, forgiveness is when you, act, when, when you accept their mistakes. Mm -hmm. See, you know they made a mistake. If you can talk a little bit about that, that uh, you, forgiveness is, 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 you believe that they accepted their mistake and through love, faith, and uh, you talked about care, you give them second, third, fourth chances, just like what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. He said, how many times would you forgive a brother? And he says, 70 times seven. I mean, if you have to count it, there's something really wrong with you. <laughs> I mean, that's 490 times, so you say, 418, 400. I'm thinking you're really counting how many times you're forgiving a person in a day. In other words, you said it's accepting the mistake and said, okay, I forgive you. The mistake is, we do understand. And with love and care, you begin to build them back up. Mm -hmm. So you, you were talking about, can you open up a bit on that? So accepting their mistake, sometimes you might not want to accept their mistake either, you know, because like the mistake they made, might, you might think is unforgivable, but no mistake is unforgivable. That's right. How can you say a mistake is unforgivable if God accepts every sin that you do and he doesn't hold that against you, you know? Mm -hmm. How can you do that towards a person? So when you accept their mistake, you have to remind yourself, what would God do in a sense? What would God do if I, if I did this mistake and he saw me do this? Would he hold this against me? Mm -hmm. And then from there, that's what moves you forward. You accept the mistake, you accept the apology, and if they want help, you help them. Uh -huh. You can't force someone for help as well. If, you you know. can help people that don't want to receive your help. Exactly. Bottom line. And uh, I heard you say the other day about also that um, you, you, talk, you talk about, you know, some people don't want to be bothered in terms of, you know, they, they, they forgive you and then I'm bothered by something. I think you mentioned something like that. Could mm -hmm. you just shed some light on that? Yes. I like to call those people the unbothered. <laughs> the unbothered. <laughs> yeah, that's like a Gen Z type term. Yeah. And I find it funny. I find Gen Z funny because everything they say is just, you know, like, it's very blunt and straight to the point. Mm -hmm. So if they say I'm unbothered, it's because they don't care. They really don't care. They don't care. So, and so when, you, when it comes to unforgiveness, how does that work with the people that are quote unquote unbothered? 
So unbothered people, as I said, they don't care. But when they don't care, it means like you can make them say 5,000 times and they'll say, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's all good. I don't care. When they don't care, that means they won't show you how to fix it. Mm -hmm. Like the complete okay. forgiveness. Say that again. If they don't care, they won't show they you. would not show you how to fix it. Mm -hmm. You see, because it's like, oh, that's your problem. Mm -hmm. I don't care if, you, if, if you're doing it against me, I don't really care. But mm -hmm. if they do care, they will take the time. Mm -hmm. I think for the most part, they don't want to invest time to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. So they say, I don't care, just to absolve themselves of saying, well, the responsibility of teaching the other person to get better. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very wise thing to, to notice the difference. Mm -hmm. And so there are other people that do care. Could you talk on that too? So the people who do care, it takes time to fix something inside of a person because mm -hmm. sometimes it's probably a habit that's been in them with like years. So it's hard to break habits. But if with love, you can break that habit. People who don't care, it's for that reason. They don't want to take that time. The people who care, they will take the time and they will save them so much effort in the long run. They will not only be saving time and energy from themselves, but they would also be helping this person become mm -hmm. a better person. Mm -hmm. The unbothered will just say it's all right. And the mistake will happen like five or six times, and that's when they break, and they'll be like, okay, oh, I told that you After the mistake has happened five or six times, when the first time they said, ah, I don't really care, mm -hmm. and it happened five or six times, yeah. and uh, what happened? It becomes a toxic relationship, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And the people now begin to say, they, they begin to react. Yeah because it's, it's come to a point they can't handle anymore, mm -hmm. and then they explode. Exactly. I thought you didn't care. <laughs> okay. <I> mean. <laughs> <laughs> that, but it's amazing, and um, you talk about some of the testimonies of mm -hmm. people. Um, do you have some other testimonies of how you know, working through people's issues has really helped them? Well, I've had previous, like I have like a lot of testimonies on this actually, uh -huh. personally. Um, I mean, college is just filled with that, you know? and. I remember specifically, like, just going back to the girl and also going back to the bully, because those two are the only two that I can think of at the moment currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But specifically with the bullies, it's happened with a couple of them. And now, to this day, they respect me. But the thing is, is that the reason why he came back and apologized to me was because he met someone who was the gasoline to his car. He met someone, because I let him go. I didn't, when he left the school, I was thankful. But at the same time, I prayed that he would find someone who would you help him. You prayed that he will find somebody who will help him. Mm -hmm. And see, God answers prayers. And so sometimes people think, well, I'm just going to pray, you know, that and really God hears you. Mm -hmm. And that he sent somebody to go and fix the problem. Yes. You see, the Bible says you pray that God will send laborers into the harvest. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just think, well, if I, I just want to fix him. No. Just pray to God to send somebody mm -hmm. to come and fix it. Yes. And uh, so what happened to the person? So he met this person, the person mm -hmm. who it pretty much he idolizes to this day. He, the person that he idolizes, mm -hmm. he is in the place that he wants to be. And the guy told him, in order for you to get here, you have to first fix who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. If you are unpleasant to be around, how are you going to be able to get here to where I am? Mm -hmm. People are not going to work around you because if you're angry or anything. So this guy started taking lessons from this guy, from his mentor. We can call him his mentor. Mm -hmm. um, he had took lessons from his mentor. It's been years, and literally it was this year he apologized to me because wow. we bumped into the mall, in the mall, and he uh -huh. said, Amy, I, he didn't re I didn't recognize him. Uh -huh. he, he was taller than the last time I saw him. <laughs> like, remember, it's middle school, so oh, boys, my goodness. they I shoot have, up. Do, don't we know that? <laughs> yeah. you, you kids. Oh, oh my, my gosh. goodness. It's, it's like insane. Caleb. Oh, my goodness, no. <laughs> okay. That's a, a whole other story, guys. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, I think about this also. What do you do with people that don't accept your advice? Mm -hmm. You see, they, they don't ad accept your advice. Or try to get better. What do you do with them? Um, well, I didn't get the chance to give this guy advice. Mm -hmm. You know, he affected me so much. I didn't even want to look at him. Uh huh. So I let him go. Okay. And as well with my friend, I let her go. You have to let them go. As yes. I said, you you can't let that. You can't be that reason the person won't get better. If you, that would be selfish of you, in a sense, if you were going to be like, I am the solution, and I'm going to force my solution down your throat, because that happens to a lot of people. Very correct. Um, the thing is, is that when you let them go, you have to remind yourself never to hold a grudge either. 
Correct. If you hold it, like, I give this example on Friday, where a grudge is like black ink in a cup of milk. So uh, a grudge is like black ink and you have a cup of milk. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So tell us the story. So, well, I, I want, I want, I'm a scientist. I'm thinking I have <laughs> pictures right now. Tell us the story. So the cup of milk, if you drop black ink, the cup of milk will become black. It will become dark. That's your heart. Mm -hmm. That's why you have to be careful with what you let in your heart. The Bible says, guard your heart. From out of it comes the issues of life. Mm -hmm. But do you realize this? Most people just keep their heart, their, the doors to their heart open and mm -hmm. take everything. It's just like taking that ink mm -hmm. and allow people to speak to them or allow issues to come in that are unrelated. So you have this milk cup, mm -hmm. but it's not longer looking like milk. And that's what happens when we allow unforgiveness to stay. Mm -hmm. So how do you fix that? So when you have like a grudge in your heart, you have to remind yourself, what would God do? That's what I think when uh -huh. I'm in a situation, if any, it considers with anything, honestly, I always think what would God do? Like if he was here in my seat and he was dealing with these people, would he be holding this grudge against them or would he let them go and let them come back in their own time when they want to listen and when they are ready, you know? That's amazing. Uh, I, I, I'm listening to this. You know, it says sometimes you, you step away from people mm -hmm. because you don't want toxicity to come close. Mm -hmm. And um, you can, you said um, some people, you can unfriend them. Just, just take a step back. Mm -hmm. And you said you sh we shouldn't sweat it. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> yeah. And you say that we're only dodging bullets. Mm -hmm. We give an opportunity to find the right person to help them. You know, and I think about this. Now, what would you th say to somebody that is, has had this unforgiveness for a long time and it's like the black ink in the milk? Mm -hmm. How can you make it clear again? It takes time. It really does take time. Personally, going from someone who was in middle school as well, who's like, he wasn't the only bully I had and mm -hmm. there was a lot of experiences. But, and it took me a while to forgive some of these people because, you know, it, it's, human as well in a sense and I was young so I didn't know the solution like I do now but when it happens sometimes all you have to do is just you know remind yourself that they are also human they don't have the they, they don't know the things that we know you know so how they how can you hold that against someone so they don't know what we know as believers mm -hmm. you see they they're working in the dark yeah but they don't know how to find their way out but for us as believers we really don't have much of a choice it's our nature yeah. So when we forgive, you, you mentioned about what, what happens to us when we forgive. You said that that's Jesus in us. Yes. You know, that means when we forgive, that God's love flowing out of us to release them of the guilt. You know, I, I, I find out sometimes most of the problem people go through, sometimes the mistakes you've made is not as bad as the guilt they faced. So sometimes the guilt is hanging over them and some of them would like to come and say, I'm so sorry for what I did to you, but they're ashamed. They're, they're, they feel guilt, they feel all kinds of things. And it's up to us to remove those things from them because Jesus lives in us. Yes. So when we go to them, we love on them and um, we don't allow those things that did to become the focal point. We look at the Jesus in us and said, I forgive you regardless of what you did. Yes. The Bible says, if Jesus forgive us if God forgave us we also ought to forgive one another yes. I think this is a very very telling message for today don't you think <laughs> yes oh my, my good I hope you guys are really enjoying this because you know she, you have a lot of wisdom I have to say <laughs> you know it's, it's amazing so but um, are you enjoying this is there something else you want to conclude with them hallelujah Maybe you talk to them about those maybe people facing unforgiveness or, or maybe they, they're carrying a grudge. How, what would you advise them to do? At the end of the day, forgive. Like before going to bed, you always want to go without that feeling of grudge, like anger. So release that anger. Don't hold against anyone anything because at the end of the day, if you're holding against something against someone, against, something against someone mm -hmm. you're closing the door on letting them see the Jesus in you and also saving them. Uh -huh. You're limiting everything around them and you're also limiting a lot of things for yourself. 
maybe this person can be the next doctor or the next CEO of a company, but because you limit their their you know their capacity, mm -hmm. you don't let them actually explore that. You should always remember, like as well, Jesus forgave us. He asked God to forgive us. That's right. When he was being crucified. That's right. So how how who are we to not forgive, forgive others? other people? You know, it's it's amazing because when we talk to some people, they tell you, "I'll forgive, but I won't forget." Mm -hmm. What would you say is the best motive for people? You know, when they say, oh, I, "Oh no, I, I'll forgive, but we can't forget this," and they almost made a mantra or a slogan mm -hmm. out of it. Yeah. But what are we supposed to do as believers, true believers? What are we supposed to do? What should be our motto? Our motto should be forgive and forget, please. Oh, some people say, but I can't forget it. I can't forget. Uh, I always say to people, have you forgotten where you kept your keys before? You can forget. Mm -hmm. You just choose not to. Yeah. But, you know, when you make a choice to forgive and forget, it cleans the, the slate for you to begin to reveal something beautiful. But whenever you forgive and you don't forget, it seems like you have a land that you want to rebuild, but you still have the junk from the past. Mm -hmm. Just staying there. You need to clear that land to build a new structure. Yes. You can't leave the debris from the old to stay in that old land mm -hmm. because it's called, I don't want to forget. Because the old debris that came from the old building that was there, you didn't clear it out. You want to remember it. Until you clear the, until you forget, clear that land, I don't think you have a, a very easy time building a new dream. So I, I, I'm going to say to everybody that's watching us, it's a good advice to forgive and to forget. You can do it. Trust the Holy Spirit to make that happen for you. Amen? Amen. I love this. I hope you guys are enjoying it. We will be right back. We're going to come back. I'm going to show you a short video. I'll come back and teach on the subject we've been having here, but um, we'll show you a short video of a miracle that happened in, and this was in Uganda, Africa. A little baby that was born and had cancer um, when she was about eight months old. They had to take away the eyeballs and uh, replace it with a plastic eye. During the campaign in Uganda, the baby was completely healed. In fact, not just healed, it was a creative miracle. The baby, the plastic eye became a real one, and it was amazing. I want you to enjoy it. I will be right back, and I'll, I'll teach you. Amy, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us today. That was amazing. Thank you, guys. I mean, you need to contact her. It's something amazing happening. I love you. I this love is you. awesome. Amen. <laughs> We're going to be right back. We're going to show you that video and let them roll it. The baby that removed the eyeball, the one that put keeps on falling. Okay, it's a plastic eye. Yeah. So the baby's blind in that eye. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Gente, senor. I'll command that eye that is plastic to recover it. I'm not saying too much. I'm not gonna come in a plastic and I don't have bait. I like crazy miracles. I like crazy miracles. I like crazy miracles. I like crazy miracles. I like crazy miracles.
How long has it been since you had a How long? Yeah. Two years. How old is she? She's two and eight months old. How long has she had the arm? Ah. Uh, it it out the skin They removed the eye when she was nine months. Because of cancer. Because of cancer. Mm -hmm. The eye is actually changing. And that comes in the Jula King. you back hello I want to welcome you back again to our daily boost the daily dose of a daily boost I am so excited for all of you that have joined me again that was a powerful segment with Amy and I tell you it was so glorious I'm looking at the miracles that happened it was amazing but I want to talk to you we're coming back to talking about walking and exercising authority we're going to roll with this very quickly 
and hopefully you will get the idea of what we're talking about. I'll give you a quick recap from yesterday about the force of righteousness. The force of righteousness. The biggest problem we find in the church is how do we break the spell of, of this, of this um, what they call traditions. The spell of traditions that seem to be cloud the revelation that we have re received. What am I saying? You see, a lot of times in churches when we talk about uh, authority of the believers, people will say things like, oh brother, you don't know, you don't know, um, I I've done everything, but uh, it, it doesn't work. How do I exercise my authority? So we've been talking about understanding the force of righteousness, that you can never reign without righteousness. So yesterday I told you about three things about dealing with righteousness. Number one, the way you look at sin. The second thing, number two, is the way we look at God and how do I see God? And the third thing is, how do I see me when I look within? Those are the things I want to talk to you about this afternoon and I hope you're ready for it. How can we break that spell of traditions that we see in churches every day. It can so easily be crystallized into rituals, religious rituals. You see, our relationship is not a ritual. It is a reality into the Jesus life. That's what I'm talking about. Understanding what he has made available. You see, Truth must be presented as realities where humans can actually receive. What has happened is we talk about things that people can understand. Talking about how do I understand righteousness? How can I operate in the fullness of what righteousness is? Now, I want to work in authority, but I don't know what, what, is, what is it that I'm missing that my authority is not being exercised. So I give you a recap from yesterday. The way we see, and the main problem with exercise authority is how do I see sin? Most people feel guilty about anything they have done in the past. So much that they lack the confidence to speak with authority. But I've been trying to tell you all through this week that the day you discover that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, it's just not just words, but a living reality, it changes everything you're doing. Most people don't understand that God has placed a premium on them for great things. You see, truth must become active in a human form, in a human flesh, and it has to be, become active in our flesh uh, and it has to transform, truth must be transformed into a living action. We cannot say that Jesus gave the disciples power and authority and they did the, and got results. And today we cannot get results because we are not as holy as they are or we are not as righteous as they are or we are not as good as they are when we ought to be doing greater works than this. Why is that? What is the problem? I know the main problem is when you are so focused on sin, how do I look at sin? How do I look at sin? I mentioned to you yesterday that the problem was not a sin problem. It is a sinner problem. It's not a sin problem. It has become a sinner problem. And that is the problem with most people. They are most sin conscious and barely righteousness conscious. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, we have obtained like precious faith in verse 1. And we have obtained like precious faith with others through the righteousness. Through the righteousness. You cannot operate without righteousness. Through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Most Christians did not know this. And so what has happened is they, they, they try so much and 
what they have is a lot of religious indoctrinations and rituals that don't help anybody. So what happens? You find a lot of people daily, they are always thinking, well, you don't understand. You know, we have this ritual in our church. We got to pray. We got to go fast. We got to do this. Those things don't mean much without revelation and transforming the revelation into action to reach out and to help people that are hurting. Revelation that are relevant that can cause an acceleration in your walk with Jesus. You see, how we start with revelation and we end up with rituals. So what am I talking about? A lot of Christians, they have church rituals. Instead of exercising authority, we have rituals, you know. We say, let's anoint with oil. We anoint with oil and the person dies or the person never gets healed. And we do all these rituals and absolutely get nothing. Why is that? I tell you why. The reason why most people never do this is because they have no understanding of righteousness. They have no understanding of righteousness. So they have been beat down by being told about sin and the mistakes of sin. Oh, see, this one sinned and this one did this. And then we use that. It becomes a ritual. So we think we have to beat our brains in to cast out devils. And they tell about holy living. Let me explain to you. I said to you the other day, I said, righteousness is what I receive as a gift from God. So that my conduct now is holy, holiness. I don't try to be holy because of righteousness. I am made holy and blameless in his sight. Hallelujah. Holy and blameless. Can you imagine that? Ephesians chapter 1. Setting from verse 3. Can you listen to the word of God? Get away from rituals. Get away from traditions. Get away from those things that do not work. You know, we do all those rituals and they do not work. But here what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. In heavenly places, in the place called Christ. Let's go to the next verse. I want you to see. It says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy, oh my goodness, holy and without blame. Without blame. Without blame and when you are talking without blame and you're holy, you're actually explaining righteousness. The ability to stand before God without a thought of guilt or shame. Completely free. The new creation does not have a, a residual mindset of sin. Does not know sin. Anyone that is born of God cannot commit sin because the seed of God is in him. And so a lot of people don't know this. So the first thing they do is they get all confused and all worried about the wrong things and nothing is happening. Are you with me? The Bible says holy without blame in him, hallelujah, before him in love. Think about that thought. Before him in love, holy and without blame. Holy, how do you see sin? A lot of people do not understand how sin is. How do you see sin? I see sin. I reject it. I reject sin. I reject the thought of trying to make me and put me under the bondage of sin. I am free. I reject it. I reject sin. How can we keep a revelation from becoming a ritual? You know, we want to pray for the sick. We have a healing ritual. You know, we lay hands and lay legs and put oil over the head and pray, call the elders who don't even believe what you're about to do. And we, we do all of those things and still get no result. Why? We have turned a revelation into a ritual. That is the problem. We have made rituals out of revelation. How do I look? I'm talking about the force of righteousness in exercising your authority. How do you see those things? How do you see? How do I see sin? I look at sin. 
and I reject it. I said, that is not me. That has nothing to do with me. I am the, uh, I am the fruit of redemption. I'm a new creature, and none of those things, hallelujah, have anything to do with me. And when I hear people tell me, oh, you did this yesterday. I said, what are you talking about? The new creation does not know those things. You are innocent of evil. Let them accuse. Of course, Jesus was accused. The only reason why you're going to act out of character is because you don't know who you are. But every day you come to the knowledge. You come to the full knowledge. You come to understanding you are royalty. Why are you going to be lowering your living to act based on what we call intuition or instinct like an animal intuition like a mere human we don't live by intuition we don't live by instinct we live by discerning by the holy ghost we are operating on a higher dimension of living people talk about intuition that's what comes from the feelings your soul it took it by instinct. It comes from the flesh, how your body re reacts to things. But when you talk about discerning, it's not intuition. It's a higher dimension of operation. It's not intuition. It comes from the spirit. The spirit speaks expressly. Because you're hearing what the spirit is saying, something else is happening on the inside of you. Are you with me? Are you with me? You see, you have to understand. People say to me, I feel. I No, I, I don't feel. I know. That is discerning. When you discern, you cannot miss because the Holy Spirit speaks. The Spirit speaks expressly. He doesn't speak with means words. Are you with me today? So, I'm talking to you about three things. Understanding righteousness. How do you see sin? I reject sin. I reject sin. You see? Don't start with revelation and end up with a ritual. The Bible says in Galatians, hallelujah, in chapter 3, in verse 1, it says, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You start out, Christ was manifestly, openly manifested, crucified for you, and everybody saw him. He was crucified, dead, buried, raised. Who has bewitched you? He was manifested before you. Galatians 3 verse 1. He said, how can you start in the spirit and you end up in the flesh? Who has cast a spell of religion, a spell of ritual, that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus had been evidently set forth, crucified amongst you. And read the next line, it says. It tells you very clearly. This would I learn of you. Receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Is it by your works of righteousness to try to obey the laws? No, it's by the hearing of faith. And when you hear and you have faith, you believe. That is counted as righteousness. And then keep reading. It says, Are ye so foolish, having began in the spirit, and ye now made mature by your feelings or your flesh? And that's what's happened. When we are talking about understanding what sin is, what righteousness is, more people, I talk to them, you can tell when they say, Oh, Father, we're asking you to come. I don't ask God to come. I thank him for living in me and reigning through me and making the world a better place. Hallelujah. It's a living reality. He never promised to be with me. He says, I am. That is not a promise. That is reality. He didn't say, I will be. That's a promise. He says, I am with you always. So why am I going to ask him to come if he already lives in me? It's called revelation. Because I am so conscious of righteousness, I really have no time to think about sin. Hallelujah. How do I look at sin? I reject it. I told you three things I'm teaching this week concerning working in authority. You cannot operate in full authority if you're so worried about your mistakes, this and that. You cannot work in authority. 
I focus on the good stuff and the good stuff is what expresses through me. I hope you're catching on to this. Are you with me? So most people don't understand that. And so they begin to struggle with rituals. We learn how to do rituals in church and we just copy it. See, we trust those before us. And so if they made a mistake, we are going to repeat the same mistake. Uh, it, brings, it brings a story of uh, a, a, a family that whenever they're eating ham, they always cut the bottom of the ham, the, ba the bottom part of the ham. They'll take it and cut the bottom part of it and then put it in the pot and cook it. Mother did that. The daughter did that. So every time they want to cook ham, they cut a bit of the bottom, the bottom part of the ham, and then cook the rest. So now here comes... The, the, the child, the, the granddaughter, and she wants to cook. And see, she saw them cut that. And the, 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 the grandchild said, Mommy, why do we always cut this? And you know what the answer was? Oh, no, um, this is how we always cook it. We have to cut that part. You know? He said, but why? Why? And uh, the mother said, oh, that's how I saw my mom do it. And that's how grandmom does it too. This little girl was very curious and decided to go and ask grandma, Grandma, why do you have to cut the ham? Isn't it the same thing? You cut the bottom part of the ham. And mom does the same thing. <laughs> and the answer was very telling. The grandmom said, we used to cut it because the pot we used to use to cook the ham was too small. So that all of it couldn't fit in. We cut a piece of it and we didn't use it. That's how we started cutting it. You see even questioned why traditions are what they are and they call it tradition but this is our african tradition this is our you know hispanic tradition this is our european tradition some stupid things we do in the name of tradition and nobody ever asked how did it start it's called religion we want to repeat that ritual you see revelation without action becomes ritual and religion revelation with action becomes reality becomes reality you're operating in the reality of the spirit but most people don't understand that hallelujah when we begin to have this revelation and it begins to affect us how do we keep this revelation from becoming a ritual you have a revelation for over the years over 30 years I have been very fresh people see me and say you are so full of fire and fresh how have I been able to keep myself regardless of what people say about me I'm gonna tell you three things that I said to you yesterday the way you look at sin the way you look at him and the way you look within how do I see sin what what what's my understanding of it how do i see god what is my understanding of him and how do i see me what is my understanding of me so what do we do how do i look at sin i reject it it's not part of my makeup i'm done with it and my authority because i understand righteousness i have a boldness and authority to speak and things will begin to happen are you with me are you with me how do we keep revelation from becoming a ritual? Let's look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. I hope this is helping somebody here. Hallelujah. You have to become a person that does not look at rituals, but keeps the revelation fresh. How do you look at sin? Rituals. Rituals. We have seen religious rituals at work. The hopelessness on the streets. You go to countries. I was when I came to Uganda the first time. I saw sick people in the streets, crippled. I went to India the same thing, and all the religious gurus who walk by with your beautiful robe, and nobody ever help anybody with all their their spirituality. No one ever opened the blind eye. I don't want that kind of spirituality that cannot help humanity, that cannot change a life and make it productive for Jesus I want the kind of life 
that when it comes to me, it impacts others and helps them to rise to their greatest potential. But religion is never like that. How do we look at sin? Stay away from the rituals. You see, they dress, they have the dancing, they do all the ceremonies. And after all of this, they work among the, ho the hopeless people. After all of this, no result. See, people attend those ceremonies. And the sick and the dying continue with their loneliness. That's what religion would do. Reject sin. Reject religion. That is what rituals and religion will do to you. All of a sudden, you do all the ceremonies, and then there's still loneliness and hurting people and no movement. But when you understand that sin is a product of religious system, sin makes money. You know, religion makes money out of sin. They will give you enough forgiveness till next week. They never tell you you're free. They always want to remind you what you did in 1902. But reject it. Reject it. When people start talking to you, walk away. When they start talking like that, smile and walk away. And tell them, I am not going to be a part of that. No. I wouldn't allow you to plan. Because I understand. I'm talking about the force of righteousness. When you understand righteousness, it changes everything. Because once you understand righteousness, you now begin to operate fully in power. You begin to operate in the fullness of God. Understanding the force of righteousness in the believer's authority. You cannot walk in absolute authority and dominion lifestyle if you have a sin conscious mentality. Sin is a product of religion. Religion makes money out of sin. They'll give you enough forgiveness to tell you, if you give me this, give me that, I'm going to forgive your sins. I had, a, I had um, one of my... Um, Indian friends in Vancouver and Sanjeet he had cancer came to our meeting in Victoria because his niece was healed she was blind and deaf healed in the meeting and the word spread around all of Victoria British Columbia and also all over Vancouver so they came from Vancouver the man was dying of cancer. They came to Victoria, Trinity Christian Center. And when they came there, he was healed. Now, he was a Hindi, a Hindu. He went back to the temple, and everybody's surprised. And when we came to visit in Vancouver, we had over 200 six sitting in the front row waiting to get born again those of you that were in glad tidings church in vancouver remember when we came there glorious meetings that morning miracles happened a boy that was born blind received his sight glorious meeting and so we went to eat at sanjit's place and he he now he's been healed for about four or five months and he was telling us he said, I, I told my, my guru, my, I, when I came for prayer because of my cancer, my guru said, no, you got to give me some money. And then he said, why would I give you so much money for prayer? He said, that's what we do because the gods wants it. And, and rituals. He said that, he told him, no. Then they heard about the, 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 the niece that got healed of blindness and deafness. It's in the book called The God of Miracles. You see her there. Guess what happened? He came, he didn't give the, the guru the money. He said to the guru, if I, why not you pray for me if it works? I double what you're asking. <laughs> I don't think the, the, the guru wasn't happy. The guru goes, oh no, that's not how it works. Just you pay us and we'll say the prayer. And then maybe it will work. But he was smart enough to say, I will double it if it works. Why not pray when it happens, I double it. So he was telling us the story. And guess what? He came to Victoria, gets Hill. We came back to Vancouver. He's telling us a story. I thought, man, you're pretty smart. You told a guy if he could really heal you, you pay twice. But you don't pay before you get the miracle. <laughs> but thank God it's free with Jesus. Only believe. All things are possible. 
only believe. I'm telling you, rituals stifles revelation. Rituals, religious rituals. They walk around with nice clothing, white robes, you know. I know some people grow long beards, stay up in the mountain 10 years because they are trying to deal with the issue of sin. They want to be holy men, holy. No, 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 no. I am already holy and blameless before him in love. That's what the Bible tells me and that's what you are holy and blameless before him. Read the book for yourself. Reject the idea that the enemy wants to get to you. You see, religion never gives you enough forgiveness. But they manipulate sin for its survival. That's how religion works. They manipulate sin to, to keep the religion going. Oh, just bring, go and get the water from here. Let's do this. Let's do that. That's religion. When Jesus shows up, he vanquished all of that religion. He says, only believe. He said, he said to, to, to Jairus, if thou can believe, all things are possible. He said, fear not. Don't be afraid. Only believe. God gave us a way we can get into this. It's simple. Only believe. You know, do you know? <laughs> you, you, I was thinking about this. We were just talking before we started the broadcast. Talking with the team. During the leadership school some people sold a thousand dollars because the holy spirit told me to, sow, uh, to tell them to sow a thousand dollars and pastor lewis was saying that was a door that was a moment that was god was giving an opportunity i am hearing crazy testimonies crazy testimonies we get we, we get a chance of sharing some of this with you you know we bring some of the people let them come and share their testimony of how they sold just as the they followed the instruction. They sold a thousand dollars and all of a sudden their capacity was enlarged. Hallelujah. Boy, I was reading one today and I was, I was just amazed. Uh, a young man, I want him to come and share his own testimony. Exactly what happened and how God has enlarged his capacity. Wow. Several of them have been telling me, I'm telling you, something is breaking out. I told you that you trust God and see what he does. Only believe. You don't pay for your miracle. No, you follow the instruction God has given. Not because of the miracle, but because you're honoring his word. That's why you do it. Stay away from religion. It belittles kings and princes and princesses. Hallelujah. Are you with me? How do we keep revelation from becoming a ritual? Sin wants us to bow. And cower and, and do all the things to it. But Jesus is the lifter of your head. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He brings you up to his level. You don't bow to the devil. He brings you up to his level. You don't bow to the devil. Are you with me? You are called to do things. And that's why the television network coming up. We want to get this message out to the world and so that you can become a partaker of what God is doing. Hallelujah. I pray that this is helping you today because you begin to learn how God moves and you begin to see things. How do I look at sin? Hallelujah. He lifts you up. Jesus lifts you up so that you don't bow to the devil. You don't bow to the devil. You look at the enemy and said you have nothing on me jesus said satan had nothing on me that means he cannot accuse you he cannot accuse you the bible declares in philippians he said he took away satan's power to ever accuse us in colossians chapter 2 he says the same thing he took away satan's power to ever accuse us of sin how do i see sin hallelujah how do i see sin I reject it. When I look at sin, I said, pay for and fall. Now I'm going to go after the devil and wipe him out. Hallelujah. I hope this is helping you. I hope you're learning something new. Hallelujah. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you tomorrow. How do you look at God? I told you I was going to teach you a bit of that today. But I needed to get a fine point. How do I deal with sin? I told you there's not a sin problem. Jesus paid for the sin of the whole world. 
So there's not a sin problem. He nailed it to his cross. Took away Satan's power to ever accuse you. In fact, I love how Colossians chapter 2, from the living Bible, if you have that translation, I want you to put it, or just put the transla translation that you have there. It says, he took away Satan's power to accuse you. Colossians 2, verse 15, let's read it. I want you to see what the Bible says there. Because you have to understand, what do you do? How do you look at sin? You reject it. Sin has no dominion over you. Hallelujah. Having spoiled principalities and power, he made an open show of them, openly triumphing over them in it. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We're going to start reading from there. I want to bring some things to you. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Because tomorrow it's going to be loaded. I'm going to be talking about how do you see him. Because that will be a turning point in how you see you. Romans chapter 6. Wherefore, therefore we were buried with him by baptism into that. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so shall we also, we shall also walk in the newness of life. Let's keep reading. Knowing this, knowing this, if we were planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Let's keep reading it. I want to read it through, then I can cut down to it. Knowing this, that our old man, our old man is crucified with him. The sin nature was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed hallelujah the body of sin you know people say oh no the 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 human is desperately wicked his you know the heart of a man is this no but i have a new spirit and a new heart the old one was wicked was deceitful but the new one he has put in me my dear friends i know it's beautiful the one he has put is it a new heart and a new spirit i'll put within you and i will cause my law my word to be on the inside of you and then you will be led from the inner witness and you will be reigning in life through one christ jesus hallelujah it says that the body of, of sin might be destroyed and henceforth we should not serve sin what is it saying you're no longer a slave to sin you're no longer a slave to sin you are free how do i see sin i see it as under me hallelujah it is beneath me so when i keep my eyes on jesus i know i'm winning every day let's keep reading hallelujah that does the body of sin might be destroyed it says for he that is dead is free from sin that's how i look at sin how do i look at sin i'm dead and my life is hid in christ with god hallelujah colossians chapter 3 verse 2 it says he that is dead is free from sin let's look at colossians 3 verse 2 set your affections on things above not on things on the earth let's keep reading because i tell you for you are dead <laughs> i like the word it says you are dead yes you are dead and your life is hid with christ and god you are dead not you will die you are dead you are dead and your life is bulletproof sickness can touch you begin to believe that and you begin to release the force of righteousness it begins to see that's the problem why People panic when a situation happens. But Jesus never panicked. He understood what it was. The Bible says, you are dead. Let's go back to Romans chapter 6. Let's look at verse 6. It's important you know what the word is saying. Important. It says, knowing that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. Let's keep reading it now. Hallelujah. For he that is dead, verse 7, 
he that is dead is freed freed past tense past tense the tense what do they call it the past participle freed from sin how do i look at sin romans 8 for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death romans chapter 8 verse 2 you see romans chapter 6 verse 7 romans chapter 8 verse 2 agree for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death everything in life is a law how diseases how COVID works there are laws in place that make COVID, COVID work that makes cancer work when you are operating in Christ something is triggered that supersedes COVID and supersedes other things but if you don't know how to activate it it never comes you can go by your feelings by what the doctors said about you you can accept their diagnosis or you can reject sin and its diagnosis you stand on the word of god and see what god can do hallelujah are you with me are you with me you begin to experience the fullness of righteousness it's, it's a force that comes to you see you reign in life through righteousness let's look at a scripture it tells you hallelujah second corinthians 5 verse 21 it tells you just as sin reign on to death it tells you i want to make sure we get it um romans 5 21 that's the scripture i need romans 5 21 it says just as sin had reigned unto death just as sin reigned and brought death even so my grace reign through righteousness grace only reigns through righteousness unto eternal life by jesus christ our lord my goodness i can tell you all those things and my prayer is you get a hold of this and run with it knowing your past is forgiven it's gone you will never come back it says that anyone that is dead is free from sin and colossians 3 verse 3 tells us exactly for you are dead you are dead anyone dead free from sin and romans 8 2 uh, tells you for the law of the spirit of life which is in christ jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death hallelujah hallelujah you are free you are free and i want to encourage you you don't want to forget to register for the power school we are talking about eternity now you need to register for the power school of miracles it is going to be wow you don't want to miss it if you're coming by train by plane by uh, uh, by horse drawn buggies whatever it is motorcycle coming by bicycle walking on your feet coming by boat i don't care parachute down here you need to register for the power school of miracles and the subject for the whole week is experiencing eternity now you don't want to miss it you don't want to miss it and i want to thank all of you that have been joining us and getting this gospel out to the world i pray that you enjoyed today's broadcast and we want to give you an opportunity I, I told you about some people they follow the instruction given during the um, the leadership school and the result coming and I can see the Holy Ghost is telling me to give that opportunity again to some people it's like a window God speaks to you release that seed and see what God can do confirming his word when you release that seed I want you to write down on a notepad or on your iPad or your phone what two things you want God to do what breakthrough you need in your life so you want to do that today you go to christlove.org, you click that donate button and say, I want to sow. If you, God's speaking for you to sow a thousand, so whatever you want to sow to be a partner with us in the gospel, we always appreciate all that you do to get the message of the gospel out. Hallelujah. And also, if you're doing it by PayPal, we have the PayPal uh, option. It's paypal.me and, and the forward slash is Charles and Defund. You want to release the seat today 
and trust God. Some of the people that are getting results, I can mention some names here. Oh my goodness. You get to hear them. Kevin. That's Quest. God did a great thing with him. He sold his thousand and God increased his capacity. I want him to come on and tell his own story. We have, we have Keon. I mean, we have, I can mention names that did that less than two weeks ago. And glorious things are happening. I've heard from at least seven or eight people telling me what God has done for them because they obeyed that window. When God says now is when you do it. Release that and see what happens. Hallelujah. Are you with me? So we have also, if you're doing cash app, you want to be able to do that. I know some of you talked about the ability to do something by, by, bank, by the bank. We're going to do that. Hopefully tomorrow we're going to put that. But I told you to inbox us. I'll be able to do that. So we have cash app. It's right there on the screen. Dollar sign. And then you have Charles and Defon, And it goes straight right into the ministry. Okay, and also, if you're doing Venmo, you have the option there at Dr. Charles in Defun, the hyphen in Defun, and you can send it by Venmo. Also, we want to give you other options. If you're making out a check at a money order, hallelujah, you want to be able to do that as soon as possible. Hallelujah. I see Chris says, my testimony is being cultivated. I know. I know it's being cultivated you are going to get mighty reports hallelujah i want to thank all of you that have joined me today you do that immediately go release your seed hallelujah release your seed today and i know that you are walking in the fullness of your inheritance god bless you and again we'll see you tonight for wisdom wednesday god bless you see you soon